So, thank you for your attention that you came here. I welcome you, fellow hackers and inventors, visionaries, contemporary thinkers, to this talk. It's about quantified self. It's something you might be familiar with. It's kind of like self-tracking, kind of like self-hacking, you know, seeing the numbers, seeing the digital self, recording, like some of you might know rescue time. That's what Christian Kleinerdam is going to talk about shortly. Later, we hear about a special case of, I would say, self-hacking, mind-hacking, possibly quantified self, using brain waves to see your digital self, your mind mirror, but of course you can do more with the brainwave stuff, which I will talk about later. So, I hope you enjoy this talk. Please welcome Christian Kleinerdam from Quantified Self Germany. Yeah. So first I will talk about Quantified Self. How many of you have heard of the term? So please raise your hand if you have, sir. Good, some have, some don't. So I'll start with introducing it. It's this nice logo, but logos don't really say much. So it's about gathering data about yourself and using this data to make decisions about your life. So there was a German newspaper which titled recently that Quantum itself or tracking bodily function is something that make, can make you addictive, so it's something really bad which the news media has to warn you about. So I don't know what that means for you. Maybe it means it's cruel, maybe it means it's bad. So make your pick. But from my perspective, it's more something that takes a bit of self discipline, so it's not like playing farm ball where you can speak from an addiction. So, yes, that's the next thing. What do I track? I track a few things. This is one of the most important things for me. It's my lung function. I track it with a peak flow meter, and since I track it, it goes up. Because I can use the knowledge, I get to the tracking to change my actions. So, in a span of roughly five months, I improved my lung function by three fourths. So that's a rather significant improvement. And you might say, maybe that's all placebo, maybe I just imagine it and somehow use it differently. So here's data from a study about how the placebo affects tracking lung function. So they tried an asthma medication and gave it to people and gave placebos and had a non-intervention control group. If they asked them for the subjective improvement, there was nearly no difference between those who get the real treatment and those who get the placebo. So if you ask people for the subjective improvement, really people get deluded whether something helps them. But if you start tracking the way I did, you suddenly see that you get the same result with the placebo and the non-control group, non-intervention control group, but the real drug makes some difference. So in this case, the measurement isn't really influenced by placebo, so the idea that you can somehow not learn something about yourself because you get distracted by placebos isn't really accurate. So, the empirical method, which is really about learning from data, doesn't have to be about reading somebody else's application of the empirical method, but it can be doing the empirical work yourself. And especially if you use technology to help you, that works well. So, the next thing is to really do experiments and with one person, participant, the most important participant for you, yourself. So, if something works for yourself, it's good, and 
It's not really that important whether it works for everybody, as long as you yourself have an improvement. You, maybe you aren't even interested whether it's placebo or where the causation is, and the improvement is the most important thing. So let's take a look at a specific case. So this robot tried to track his cognitive performance with an arithmetic test and measured how much time it took to solve those problems. And over time, those changed. And then he found, he thought about what made the difference between the change. And he went back and found that it was eating 30 grams of butter. But he changed his diet a bit. And after the diet change, he suddenly had was faster. Oh, so then he was faster, and he went and told other people about the result. And at first, he got a bit negative feedback. People thought he was maybe crazy, because butter is supposed to be really bad for you. But um, he had data, so the people thought maybe there is something, but we don't really want to believe him, so let's try to do it ourselves and do an experiment. So they gathered 27 people and put them in three groups, one butter group, one coconut oil versus another fat, and there are some results which suggests that it helps with um, Alzheimer's, so there's some possibility that it could also be good for the brain. And another group with neither butter nor coconut oil. And on those 27 people, they found that the butter group beats the others, which um, is statistically significant amount, and 5% faster on the mass test. So, do I want to all convince you to eat butter because I say so? No, I don't. I want to convince you to think about ideas and see whether they work. And seeing whether something works doesn't have to be about doing it and then deciding, do I feel like it works or does it feel like it doesn't work, can be about getting hard data about whether it works. So we now have the technology to track a lot of things and test things for ourselves. We aren't anymore in a position where we need to believe other people and their results, whether those people come from academia or whether they are priests. We can do empirics ourselves, and being an empirical thinker doesn't have to be any more about reading about theories as other people make. Empirical thinking can be about testing stuff for yourself. So, um, I developed um, an open source application for tracking cognitive performance. But even if you aren't interested in cognitive performance, you can track a lot of other things. I had the example from my lung data. And then there are a lot of other hardware solutions. So you can track physical activity with a pedometer. You can track sleep with multiple things. You can rate yourself. And all those things give you hard empirical data. Unfortunately, at the moment, most of the hardware that you can buy isn't open source, maybe that will change, hopefully it will change. That's one of the reasons we talk here. But those hardware is still useful if you want to do experiments. And if you have results, and maybe you want to have results but don't know how to track, you can talk to other people. And in Berlin, we started last month 
the first quantified self meetup in Germany. In the US, there are for a longer time other quantified self meetups. And when you are there, you can put, say, tell the people about your ideas, what you found worked for you. Other people can try to replicate it. And you aren't any more subject to some expert which tells you how to live your life. But you can really see whether something works for you, whether it works for your peers. And so together there are 42 meetups in the world at the moment. In Berlin, it, we had our first one this month. And in Germany, we have now four cities with people who want to do meetups. And if you are interested in the topic, here are website addresses where you can look and find people in your local community to do it. And that's basically my message. It's really great to track something about yourself. It's really great to improve yourself with it. And finally, to talk to others about it and find a way to share your knowledge and improve on the knowledge by seeing whether it works for other people. And now we will move on to a specific um, open source hardware application for brain waves, which MetaMind is going to talk about. Well, thank you, Mr. Kleinedan. So maybe uh, let me add a, one or two things to this. Um, Gary Wolf, the founder of Quantified Self, he always refers to the microscope. So it goes beyond the individual. As an individual, you can hack yourself, you can track yourself, you can do all kinds of stuff. Improve yourself, that's very cool. But then there's a part to society, and we all basically do this together. But he calls it the microscope. You have the microscope, you look deep into matter, and you have the microscope. The microscope shows you how things are coming together, kind of the emergent properties, you know, how things are coming together. Basically, the big picture. And that's what it is. It's the microscope and the things you can see with it. And that basically is the quantified self community also in part. And it's about community. So there are meetings in major cities around the world, including Germany. You can come to those meetings. And when you come to those meetings, it's all about what did you do? How did you do it? And what did you learn? So maybe uh, do uh, one question or something uh, while I'm preparing Q&A things. Just one question. Would be possible. Wow! The laptop, laptop actually turned off. That's fascinating. <laughs> Just when the slideshow ended. So I guess someone has a laptop with open office. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, this thing lasts five hours. It runs Linux, gentle Linux. Never crashes, but you know, Chaos Congress. Uh, it's kind of a cool thing. So let's improvise. Might all be staged, because he's actually the software guy. You will hear from him later how all these things really kind of work. And yeah, then there are these crazy, interesting, cool people called the Heralds who have VGA adapters for <laughs> Steve Jobs visionaries. <laughs> Gonna have. Does anybody have an VGA adapter? Yes, yes. <laughs> Does okay. anyone have a question about quantified self? You know. Uh... So I think ten would be enough. It's crazy, crazy shit. <laughs> so let's do Q and A about quantified self. <laughs> what do you think about? Hello. People, you can check your email or just use the chance to talk about quantified self. What do you mean, quantified self? What could this be? What is it for you? Hmm? Possibly. Most likely.
Well, I'm sure you have things to do, right? You know, look up quantified self DE, for example, quantified self dash DE. You can look it up. And we can talk about it. Hello? Or you can sit quietly. <laughs> um, I have a question, cool. or a comment, rather. Uh, I, uh, I found the job on up, just like, just like you did. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to work. Uh, it seems to suck majorly. Uh, ah, excellent. Ah, yeah, five <laughs> replacements, right. But obviously, someone is going nice. to get this right at some no. point. And what the job on up is, is essentially just a bunch of sensors attached to your wrist. Um, so no, I okay. thought, you guys, you should um, what about seriously talk to uh, the USB Connect dude, uh, who reversed engineered the audio protocol for Connect. What about ThinkPad power adapters? Um, and then, uh, and then you can make an um, open source uh, implementation of the client, obviously, for the job on up. Or even more awesomely, you walk into the basement and you talk to the guys that build the Arduino stuff. And uh, hopefully, adapters. in a year or two. I will have my very own open source um, group of sensors attached to my arm, and then I can measure everything I want. Uh, so I'm, please make this for me. I want it. Exactly, that's a good point, sir. So, um, there are a lot of sensors which are really cheap, and where you can build something with it. So one of the things we built is an EEG, which also works on the open source um, hardware stuff. But even if you don't want to build hardware, um, smartphones today have a lot of sensors. And if you want to have a pedometer, okay, but the, the sensors uh, are in nearly every phone. Writing good software, which gives good data from it, isn't that hard. But it's something that somebody should do in open source. But, as always, there isn't enough time for everything, except when huh. computer errors are there and we have to fill up time. No, 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 and it's of course useful time, quantified self time. It's a brain interface, but I mean, uh, you know. Yes, I will do what I must so, do. It's like the Jabron app. It doesn't always work, computers, but now, you feel confident you answered the question? Cool. Good. So, uh -huh. let's talk about OpenBCI. I guess you have all already. Uh huh. It's a PDF. Cool. Um, so, OpenBCI, brain computer, brain body, brain bio interface. It's about the biosignals, the bioelectrical signals of living beings. So, but it's, you know, down to earth. Really simple science, just EEG and uh, all these other signals. And I was going to, yeah, you know, I kind of like to do it with other things. Aha. Uh -huh. So, I was going to talk about motivation, but you know, to me it's kind of obvious when I was eight, I thought, you know, could eventually have some kind of brain computer interface or called it differently. So I'm going to skip the motivation part and refer <laughs> to applications. To applications. So, like I said, it's really down to, to earth science. Basically, EMG, ECG, and EEG. That's 70, 80, 100 years old. Some people do it for longer technology. So we have electromyogram. It's basically measuring the pulses that go from the neurons to the muscles. We have ECG. It's like a hard thing, you know, in, in hospitals and the EEG, and usually it's kind of like, um, you know, takes some time to prepare and it kind of looks weird, EEG, medical EEG, and basically OpenBCI combines all those possible appliances with open hardware, with open software, into one easy to use package, one software framework, that basically for the open source community to be used, and possibly provides uh, also open source biosignal social network solution, kind of setting up on GNU-Net and things like that, and possibly plug in for Diaspora, so you don't want to be putting your brainwave data to Facebook, but you possibly want to be comparing it with your friends. You want to maybe see other friends who have heart rates similar to yours or brainwaves. Maybe you're looking for an artist, so you can see, oh, right hemisphere is active, we'll come to that later. 
So EG is somehow to me the most fascinating because it's about the brain, you know, the heart kind of bump, bump, bump. It's like a, like a wave if you look close at it, but then the brain waves are really, you can really look at them for a long time. Basically, I've been doing it six years. But the basic thing is, it's a, basically a bass frequency. You go from 5 to 50 hertz, that's usually what they look at. Higher frequency are kind of unresearched, you know, they are kind of sometimes when the brain is like really doing something special, you can have gamma waves. But usually, humans, homo sapiens, doesn't have them, only mutants or someone. So let's look about the normal brain waves. We have the delta waves. As you can see, most people have them in deep sleep. That basically means <laughs> when you're not dreaming, when you're like really, like really sleeping, or basically shut, it, shut down completely, you have basically almost no activity. That's not so much interesting. Then theta waves become more interesting. That's basically when you're dreaming, when you have REM sleep, you have theta waves. So the brain is, it's the lowest frequency the brain can go to and still be somewhat conscious, as you might have observed in your dreams, at least it's possible. And sometimes have them in dreams, you can get to them in meditation if you do really serious stuff, like Zen meditation, Tao meditation, you can shut your, some people can shut off their brain completely except theta waves. But the usual thing you want to have in the beginning is alpha waves. They are uh, for relaxation. So basically, when we try out the system later, you can come down to the table or to any German European hackerspace. There will be workshops there. You can try it. And basically, if you just close your eyes and inhale deeply, most people can't resist to generate alpha waves, basically relax. And that's kind of a way I test my system. You know, if you're measuring brain waves, you could be measuring alien interferences, whatever, some kind of thing. You probably argue that whatever you are measuring is noise. But when I close my eyes and inhale deeply and I generate alpha waves and everything turns off, it looks like a good calibration to me. Let's skip all that stuff. There are better waves. That's usually, you can read that stuff. You know, you focus, you work. So then we have certain technology to influence the mind. Basically, there have been oral beats. The details, you can look it up in the wiki, Wikipedia. Don't want to bore you with it. It's not that important. They kind of stimulate your, your mind, you know, with different frequencies. There are also noise things which are particularly interesting different forms of noise, and there's a, so there's an auditory way, basically through all senses, to influence your mind and your brain waves. Classical approaches have been done by the hippies or by shamans, kind of look into a fire, you know, you see something like flackering around, it will make you kind of relax or even possibly see some guard beings or basically meditate, shut off your frontal cortex. Uh, hippies have been doing it, I particularly like it, you just take a turntable, make a cardboard box, make some holes in it, spin the turntable at a certain frequency, possibly listen to music, and you get the other effect, added effect of, if you look at it at different heights, different frequencies. That's the classic way, of course, you can do it in a different way, like modern things, you can have DMX controllers, you can control them, of course, with APIs, correlated to your brain waves, you know, and the first thing I did was like shooting different colors of light at me when I was sleeping or meditating, that could be interesting. Also, there are appliances like for events, you know, parties, people have multiple headsets, there's like a bubble of orange people here, interestingly conversing, there's like a purple, purple cloud of people meditating possibly. And then it's the classic approach, you maybe know Mitch Altman, the mind machines, you combine all this technology, the simplest possible mind machine, I'm, I should say, is, 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 is the mind machine from Mitch Altman, it basically blinks a little bit, makes some sound, and you can, you can experience this and you can build it yourself in a few minutes, it's really cool. I made another software where you can like really complexly say how this should be, and let's check out that Steve Jobs mouse. Yeah, basically you can say, uh, you know, go down, that's, that's just for brainwave flexibility, Basically, the thing I come go down gradually and wait always with the brain waves, you know, wait for, for the brain to follow. You can measure that with the EEG later. If the brain is following a step, go down, go down. Well, while the brain is following, you go down. And then this is a particularly crazy thing. It's for brainwave flexibility. I have this idea we are all kind of locked to certain, I see this in the data actually, You're kind of locked to certain mental states, to certain brain waves, kind of like not using our brain, just to certain parts of it. This is supposed to be designed to like widen up, you know, the possibility the brain can go to. And so you can make those classes, control them with a microcontroller with USB, or uh, as I said, use DMX slides. Then we get to the uh, application. For example, one is neurofeedback. No, it's really, don't believe me, it's really classical science. If, if you get like depression or something, just go to a doctor who, who knows a little bit more about modern times. He will just send you to a neurofeedback practitioner and you will adjust your brain waves. You know, it's no big thing. If you have depression, you're locked in a brain state, you get out of it. If you imagine, have imaginary chronic pain, it's just in your mind. It's seriously, you go to a doctor, and you can change it in four sessions of 15 minutes, as uh, certain studies say. 
Um, so I got heavily inspired by that. You can change your brain waves. Well, let's see how the open source software world thinks about it. And there was the OpenG project. I've been doing this for six years, but actually certain people started this like 10 or eight years ago. OpenG really, really pioneers. And so that's a slide without images. Let's see what is written there. Yeah, that's actually a big thing. How does it work? You know, I'm not like whipping someone, you know, all on the Pavlov, Pavlovian dogs who generate saliva. Uh, you can do many things. You can shoot light at you, you know, you can, you can have bad smells or dis disharmonic sounds. I only go the, nobody's forced, you know, I only go with rewarding. So the simple way you can tune your mind into any brainwave is simply by measuring the EEGs at any given time. And because your brain is oscillating always a little bit, kind of like wobbling around just a little bit, you're kind of in an alpha state, kind of in a waking state as it appears to be, most of you are, it's still wobbling around. And whatever you go into the right direction, I just reward you. Basically with intense imagery, you know, nature, you know, life forms of various shapes. Um, harmonic sounds, another way. You can do like put sugar in your mouth, but that's kind of, I think, for rats, not for postmodern hackers. So I suggest the sound thing, you know, it's kind of really cool if you start to do sound. The brain naturally likes harmonic sound and thereby adjusts the brain waves to make the sound more harmonic. And then depending on how you calibrate the system, basically you are turning knobs at a brainwave synthesizer with a feedback loop which affects your mind. So it's really that simple. If you want, you can try it out. Turn knobs, kind of design a new mental state. You know, certain substances, psychonautic things can give you certain brainwaves more. Certain music, Beethoven or dubstep music can give you certain brainwaves. But you can design states, you know, and simply zone into them. It's classic conditioning. That's kind of an overview how the hardware works. You know, it's really straightforward. You have silver electrodes because they like lower frequencies. We have a noise filter, everything except 5 or 50 hertz we kind of don't care about, at least in my case. Then you amplify, you analog digital convert. You have some kind of computing element, like a microcontroller is kind of cool for it. USB Bluetooth serial port, I suggest the Bluetooth way because it's really compatible, not like... Nah. Uh, and then you have a TCP network stream, which is really nice because in any programming language you can do two lines or something and have some kind of Fourier transformation which used to be impossible on your home computer. Now you can do it like hundreds of times on your smartphone and see what the premise look like. So the hardware is really simple. Nowadays it's just basically a small integrated circuit actually which will appear in your iPhone 5 if you have an experimental version. It contains certain chips. It will be built in for the consumer EEG market. You just take this device, so there's some hardware. It's basically museum, uh, you know, historic edition, modular EEG. It's the very popular one, started eight years ago. You can sort it yourself. It's kind of hands-on. You can really see how you're like amplifying bass frequencies or brain waves. Then there's monolith EEG from German like engineer. It's SMD, it's a lot better quality. And now there's open mind. And basically it's a Texas Instruments chips or there are multiple chips coming out. This size, just a little larger than an Arduino nano chip at mega chips. And they, you know, the modular EG has two channels, monolith has four. And those chips, they have eight or 16 channels of higher resolution EG. They're actually sampling with up to 10,000 uh, times a second, you know, and 24 bits um, resolution. And you can stack them endlessly. So you take one chip, you have 16 channels, you know, I'm kind of happy with four or six channels, and they're like 30 or 50 euros. You stick next to them an Arduino, you have some Bluetooth board, you can see downstairs, and you have a board of this size that's amplifying your brain waves or bio signals. You can just put on a headset like this, and uh, basically record your brain waves when you're giving talks or, you know, certain other things, meditating. Let's skip all that. So the headset is kind of the part that's most uh, interesting now because the rest is just a chip. Like I said, you attach it somewhere, it works, it sends Bluetooth. That's what OpenBCI at least makes sure of. And so you build cool headsets. You know, it's like really artistic. You can do like diadem headset, like a king's crown, or you can do like steampunk headset with complex mechanics and automatic like electrodes, movings, and solar powered. <laughs> yeah, be creative, be creative. I'm looking forward to it. What I kind of do is uh, attach a solar charger for a smartphone. It has an included lithium battery and it charges even with no regular lights. So it's, uh, I have really a solar headset that charges all the time from artificial or real light, has a, has a chip on it and you don't even need an antenna. You make an S-shape. You have a full wireless Bluetooth headset with as much electrodes as you like, uh, which really has certain styles. So the electrodes, there are many ways to do electrodes. I had some on earlier. This is kind of a fractal flower electrode, so, you know, it might be possible if you have a certain pattern, you're, you know, what are you actually me measuring? 
like charge uh, from millions of neurons accumulating on your head. It has something to do with electromagnetism, you know, Tesla did experiments. You, you might effectively be, be having an antenna or something. Also, if you're in a Faraday cage, you, you can do the contactless. So I kind of do the electrodes like a fractal antenna. And they should be made of silver or gold if you have that, because of the low frequencies. And that's kind of like one headset, base, very basic headset, can look like very adjustable, durable. And the headset is about like five euros. It's basically like uh, women's hair rings and like a headphone. Of course, you can do some Technics headphones. You can put all the stuff inside. It's just basic kits. You can do a wearable technology. So here we have the lily pad. Some of you are familiar with. You can basically completely, you know, be creative, have certain wearable technology that includes certain biosensors. Like I said, you can put six electrodes on the, around the heart, around the stomach area, certain areas, make like a belt, or this thing is like a, like a compass, like an additional sense. It gives small electrical signals, the north pole from sense bridge. It gives you like um, small electrical stimuli when you go to the north direction. So after a few days, you will just kind of, oh, north is here. I just kind of feel it, you know, different senses. You can come up with that stuff. That's kind of the transhumanism direction. With brainwaves, that's also interesting, like creating UV light or something that's a little bit too crazy. So that's the commercial devices. Uh, I cannot check them out, but I, I rather think they're not uh, really stylish. But really stylish, most, most of them like, require certain forms of gel or saline solution. And they're more expensive. It's really hard to get the open source, to get the raw data. They kind of allow you to shoot in games or something. Uh, but you always have the API, and to get the raw data, you kind of have to pay like 700 or 1,000 euros to get a research license, and still uh, it doesn't really work well. So just to give you a comparison. So then, that's how the basic visualization looks like. That's kind of how I process the signal visually, and it's you know, a little bit chaotic. Basically, you have filters, average metrics, certain digital sig signal processing things. You have left and right. Um, Brainwaves displayed here in a Fourier transformation. You go from 5 to 50 hertz, and it goes back in time. I will show you a video, possibly, if the Gen 2 is booting. Left and right hemisphere, and the other thing is kind of like a metric. Left and right is going up and down, depending on, uh, on your hemispheres. You should see this in, in action, especially if you, if you try this, like a little bit in a quiet place. After a certain time, your brain will kind of be, uh, become aware what I'm seeing here, what I'm hearing here, you know, somehow seems to be correlated to something inside me. And this is wake up, wake up experience, you know, kind of like lucid dreaming. And uh, you are kind of become able to control the lines, you know, make them go up and down. Kind of say, oh, I'd like some more purple here. And if you're not like really tensed, you can do it. And basically then change your brainwave. So that means uh, if you want to be more creative, there are no more days like, I don't feel really concentrated, I, I, you know, I can't concentrate, have a writing blockade, no creativity. Just basically look at this visualization for five or ten minutes, tune into creative mode, tune into focus mode, tune into shut off mode, like sleeping problems, you know. It's just for homo sapiens, but uh, you don't need to have those things, you can do something about it. Let's skip all this, I might be showing you a video, just check out the website, you see it in the lower part, you know, most of the things you can just look up at yourself, I just wanted to show you, things are possible, if you're kind of interested, look it up and we can cooperate, every hackerspace has a group, and uh, you can meet me there. So digital signal processing, just, you know, some guys know what it is about, wavelet transformation, Fourier transformation, sliding window, FFTs, all these things, you can do them, and that's interesting, psychologists, they never do this, I don't understand, they always say, well, you kind of look at the brainwaves for many years and you get, kind of get a feeling if this person is schizophrenic or autistic. What the fuck, you know? I mean, uh, do some signal processing, find out at least certain frequencies, which is really easy possible. Like in any program language, you just say open signal, do FFT and visualize, and then it's three lines of code. Why not do it right now? Anyone have you has laptops? Well, maybe later. Then there's a the cool thing with clustering and data mining. Personally, like that a lot. Data bionics, kind of inspired from nature. Uh, things like simulated annealing, you express data kind of like a, you know, kind of like a mountain range. You put in the data as water and you shake it around, you shake it around, certain things fall to a place. It generates maps like that. It's called an emergent self-organizing map. Basically, it's a po technique to project n-dimensional, like if you have 20 electrodes, you have 20-dimensional data. How are you going to like visualize that? I'm working on fractal visualizations, but which is really, this is crazy stuff, you know, really down to science, uh, it's emergent self-organizing maps, PCA, they will cluster and project their data in three-dimensional format, which happens to be the best format the brain can understand, you get the feedback loop, you get the feedback loop. That's a really interesting part. 
Um, well, that's, you don't have to look at this very much, but it's kind of like a software framework we are suggesting, um, which could be used for any bio signal. You have inputs, you have network streamers, whatever, databases, clouds. If you want, you can look at it and help work on it, try it out. Um, then, oh, I don't want to read that, you know, applications, you know, you could have hours for it. Look it up, read it up, think about it yourself. I particularly like the MIDI sound thing. You can, of course, you can do turntable control. Your left brain is like logic, so you just do mental calculations, you know. Come up with interesting mental calculations you can solve, but are not that easy. Your left brain will basically become active. And I can, you can see that in the signal. You will turn the pitch up. Your, left, your song number one will be playing faster and slower, faster, slower. Then you kind of like be creative, think of a beautiful moment, you know, from your life. And uh, you will have right activity. Could be interesting. Demos are following. But then what I like is send this shit to synthesizers. Analog synthesizers basically governing the left hemisphere is just doing the rhythm. So you can easily kind of very quickly learn now, 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 now. Or like, don't. Or like, now. Just bring your mind into the outside or in the inside. That will make a clear signal in your left hemisphere. And in my, in my setup, it governs when there is a sound. So like, tuck, 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 tuck. Depending on your right hemisphere, you get a pitch. So, and that's fascinating because you are you're subconsciously creating music. You know, usually you need 10 years to master the grand wing piano or to master the sitar or something in your lifetime. And eventually you become able to like freely improvise on an instrument. And then cool things happen. Creativity happens, composing. You have heard about Beethoven, things, people like that who are, who are deaf and still compose. And that usually takes a lot of effort. With this system, you just kind of generally give a background beat, uh, half consciously, you know, and let your right he brain hemisphere or wherever you put the electrodes kind of do the rest. And the brain will like harmonic sounds, and the right hemisphere will be creative. <laughs> and so you will have, I have done this hundreds of times, it starts like ding doodling dong ding dong ding and eventually it becomes a rhythm. Eventually, after five or ten minutes, it becomes more harmonic, like a sine wave. And people who have never played an instrument are just doing drum and bass or classical music or dubstep, break lines or synthesizers. You can also put multiple headsets into the audience. You know, it's kind of stressful for me to, to people break their headsets. Could be giving you headsets and then you are the bass line, you are the synth. Kind of mix it together, you're making live music. You know, it's not about the person in front anymore who's spent their whole life and somehow has a talent for a piano. This creative thing, especially music, I think it's, it's obvious. Then self-control mental state. That also is one of the things that got me into it. It's kind of me what meditation is about. You just you know, go into a mind state that you want to be in. Be creative, be sleeping, be dreaming, be active, be flying around. Whatever you want to be, you can learn that. That shows certain studies, do it four times, 15 minutes. So the feedback, you get rewarded, your brain goes into it. You kind of feel a new muscle in your mind that you will be able to use. But the way I do it, I kind of visualize like a symbol, like a magical symbol, like burning with flames, you know, with lightning. And then I have an NLP anchor. If some of you are familiar with it, I just visualize the symbol and fall down. But be careful about it. Um, sleep induction, that's what I said. Don't want to be doing it if you're on the stage. Lucid dreaming, fast learning is fascinating. You know, it's not a topic, but look into it. Increased leads to increased mental capacity. Brainwave synchronicity is another cool thing when you start to synchronize your, your parts of your brain. So left and right hemisphere is interesting. All the basically mystic meditation traditions tell you you have some kind of third eye, it's in the middle of your brain, and you're supposed to like synchronize things. It's basically the corpus callosum, the connection between your both. You have, actually, we have two brains, you know, left and right. They're communicating, and how many connections are between those? Every neuron can have tw 20 connections at least, but most humans have like two or three. So there's certain potential to have more connections with neurons, and that kind of, you know, People understand web theory and graph theory. It's significant. If all the neurons have like 10 connections instead of three connections, it's a holographic, you know, consciousness thing. You can simply train for that. You don't need like a, some kind of kung fu master who will teach you for 20 years in a cave. Just do it with your iPhone or with your Android phone. Well, I'm getting drifted off. <laughs> Just read that stuff, you know. <laughs> Increased brain self-regulation, neurofeedback, accelerated learning. So basically, fast learning. I've done some experiments. If you want to learn a language, you just display images, display the words in their original writing, in their polygraphic writing, get them from Wikipedia, get them from Google, display the words, display the iconic images, make a sound, left and right, maybe left is German, right is English, or Japanese, or Sanskrit, or Basque are particularly interesting, Old Hebrew, 
and basically bombard your brain, I mean, that's a rough word, basically expose your brain to all this information, and if you're in a learning state, the brain will, I mean, if you're in an alpha state, the brain will at least like, uh-huh, uh-huh, what the fuck is this? Uh -huh, I try to make like pattern matching. And then that's the problem. If you start going faster and faster, like with fast reading or fast learning, usually the brain will at some point shut off. You will, you will see this in meditation. That's all what meditation is about, noticing when, when you're not like present anymore. Interesting, power, you know power? Ha <laughs> 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 ha, let's laugh. So, where was I? The accelerated learning. I see the potential at least a little bit. I mean, you kind of uh, show information faster and faster, basically reading text, seeing images of languages, and the brain will shut off and no longer follow, but you won't realize. So you will try to keep learning, you will try to keep reading, jumping back, jumping back. Everybody knows that you keep reading because in school they taught you keep reading the same way. And eventually you realize, oh, I didn't get anything, I have to jump back a little page, you know. With EG, you simply notice that there's this P300 signal in the brain. You can immediately see in the brain, ah, the brain is understanding. Or, oh, what's this? You can see this clearly in the brain. It's P300, event correlated potential. So you speed up the learning, but slowly, you know, so the brain won't go into this, oh, what is this? But we'll stay in the, ah, ah, ah information. Hmm, I like information. I like connecting information. That's actually the case. And don't be too fast, you know. I can learn something about this myself, maybe. And you can do fast learning. I mean, you know, maybe next year some more talks, or just experiment with it. You know, the hardware is not the issue, the software is not the issue. This is really interesting technology. So you can put the electrodes in many places. I usually put them on the left and right frontal cortex because I'm kind of into consciousness, you know, exploring and things like that. And so you have logic, somehow conscious awareness of logic and conscious reflection of logic, whatever it means, and conscious awareness of creativity, which I kind of like to train. Uh, but you could put electrodes if you want to control stuff. Like five years ago, I did like a quadrocopter, quadrocopter control thing. You can have your Bluetooth phone, or you can have your Bluetooth brainwave headset, and basically use left and right hemisphere to make the thing go up or down, left and right, two channels you can control things. In that case, you want to use the motor cortex, which is right, right on top of the head. And basically, your whole body, your sensory experience, is mapped on that parts of the brain, and especially your hands, your lips, but still, also your legs are a very large area, so it's really simple to put an electrode there. And I cannot like see if you look like, you know, if you're like doing Tai Chi, I cannot tell you like how perfectly exactly you're moving. But I can say something is going on with your hand, something is going on with your leg, and probably most people will be running or walking. So you can do that to control things, you know. Uh, just stand there, like meditating or sitting, and imagine you're like walking, running, moving your hand, and it move in a 3D universe, control fighter jets. Or quadrocopters. I like the quadrocopter thing. You, know, kind of, you can kind of make a show out of it with your hand, but it's, it's your mind. <laughs> well, just look at it later. Put electrodes, you can put it into the Wernicke's area, it's the speech center. I cannot tell you what words you are saying, but I can tell you how long the words are. I can, you know, you can use it for control things. The visual cortex is interesting. In Braunschweig, they show you like go or, or chess patterns very quickly oscillating and look what comes back in the, in the cortex. They also have this basically information flowing through your brain from front to back. And if you turn a knob, it will turn something in your mind. So now the boring part starts. Please start checking your email. I'm kind of losing energy. What does this mean? You know, where does it go? We all know about industrialized technology, what it meant, you know, mass producing. It's not only kings who have certain things, not only meditation masters who can do certain things, like everybody kind of can you know, have many things. There's Moore's law, so it will very certainly happen. I've seen it over the last years. Precision, processing power, usability and comfort will rise significantly. Physical size, material cost, energy need will decrease. I showed you the hardware, it's just a simple chip. SMD, very low power. And we have things like internet communication, you know, industrialized technology is cool, internet communication with open community, social groupware, cloud computing, and crowdsourcing are somewhat, I think, like a motor of evolution. We'll see about it. Then there are certain things possible which I haven't implemented completely, but I think are possible. You can read it, you know, you can read it. It's very abstract, I don't want to explain it. Um, it's all about open community, at least with open BCI. Let's share, let's collaborate the ideas we have. It's just work on the projects, have fun, possibly build a kit, improve it, hack the project, you know, you know what it's about, and let's build a brainwave social network, you know. Um, 
that might be interesting for future things. I have a Japanese friend who's been doing this for 40 years, actually, with the, with the first Mac computer. He used analog synthesizers and, you know, very with tube, tube visualizers to, to have, like, a brainwave signal, and he's, like, did it for 40 years. He's in Japan, and I regularly kind of, like, synchronize my brainwaves with his friend over the Internet. And so why, why not, you know, you can say you don't need a personal computer in your home. I think we might be having some fun with brain interfaces in our home. At our workplace, I mean, it's coming anyway, you know, and certain medical people, probably your, your employer, they will just say, don't use Facebook, they limit that they do this, and they will say, um, we are measuring your brainwaves, and if you're not focusedly working, we kick you out, you know, so be aware of the brainwaves, of course, I'm very aware. Um, it's, it, you can do something yourself, you know, kind of like a defense thing, you know, certain people will measure your brainwaves, you want to be know what's happening, you can play with those people, certain reverse engineering of their techniques, and you can basically have this power, you know, watch TV, people are really manipulating your minds. I mean, it's really obvious, certain hypnosis, NLP things, watching TV is kind of, you know, very questionable. Using Facebook all day, you know, not consciously, like, connecting with interesting people, but clicking around, you know, looking at ads, it's kind of the same thing, we're all plugged into the matrix anyway, you know. Most people, if you look in the trains, why not be conscious about it, why not do it yourself, why not hack it, why not share with your friends what crazy brainwave project you're doing. Um, that's what it's about, Brainwave Social Network. I'm working on it, he's working, we are working on it. I certainly invite you to try it out, sign up, or, you know, contribute code. I think, you know, I, I expect, I'm talking here when I'm done, you know, five people have uploaded stuff to GitHub. That would be cool. So now, I still kind of, yeah, I invite the leading software architect, the mechanic of the sequence, the lead software guy to talk a little bit about the software vision while I'm messing around with my Gen 2 laptop and see if I can show you some videos later on. Okay, so. Please um, give a warm applause. Uh, <laughs> okay, so all those like applications that he had up there, boring. You know, we're not going to worry about that because that's like old technology. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, full screen. How do I do this? Apple shift. Mm. There you go. Got it. Okay, so the software interface. This is where things get fun. So I've got lightning round guys. Those guys. So he needs a pen and paper. This guy needs our hardware. And I need a whole world full of programmers. Moving on. So, I don't have much. But I decided to start thinking about things a bit differently because the world's changing a bit. And instead of trying to power out all this code myself, what I really have is like all of you guys. So I have to figure out how to do this on an open source way. So we need a, we need to make a big system. So we need an, we need an editor with a, a GUI interface. So if you guys are familiar with um, Steve Jobs, maybe the next uh, presentation video, he shows how he makes interfaces, those sorts of things. I want to make that. So. You also need a symbolic programming language. So what is a symbolic programming language? A symbolic programming language is a language that you can recognize without having to see text. And then you need sequences or routines. And then you need an ecosystem of routines. That's where you guys come in. But we're getting there. So browser, GUI editor, I figure I can just reuse some Ajax or its components, blah, blah, blah. Language needs to be JavaScript, CopyScript, or whatever, my future symbolic language. Um, and it needs to be in real time. So let me just talk about a symbolic programming language. This is something that I want to work on, um, but don't really know how to start. Well, actually, I know exactly how to start, but whatever. So it needs to be, it needs to be able to translate from text to um, the symbolic language. I'll get to that in a second, and then back. So um, if you guys saw the other chat on the uh, Cartesian prog uh, genetic programming, uh, this might sound familiar. So each, so each sequence is sort of like a set of logical sequences, right? So using Cartesian programming or something similar, we will be able to optimize these routines. But um, that's in the future. Let's just try and get the first part now. So what we need to do is we need to remove the separation between syntax, making them sequences, logic, and make the programs seem sort of like functions and like variables. Like basically blend variables, programs, functions, and the interface all together. So, 
So now think of a sequence. So what is a sequence? So a sequence is, well, let me describe them first. I'll come back here. So like, let's say you have, this is my first design, just to give you guys an idea of where I'm going with this. I'm trying to do as much research as I possibly can. So imagine you have four axes where each axis has positives and negatives and neutral values. Well, in this concept, I have four elements. And in the fire world, I have definitions. These are packages, functions, and variables. That's how I can remove all my whatevers. I have conceptual items, which are always true in a program, never true, or undefined behavior. These can be defined as sequences and will be sort of like built-in unit tests. Because the program can be used and the prog uh, inside of the interface using sequences, it automatically would build unit tests as you're doing it. That's okay. We're getting back there. Interface is the earth. So we need to have, so why is this important? Because with a brain interface, um, on your logical side, this is where your consciousness is, on your left brain. But then on your left hand side, on your, uh, or your right brain, you have many subconscious things going on at one time. It's like a huge parallel processor. Well. This sort of prepares your entire body to run through these sequences. Well, think about when you're riding, learning to ride a bike. At first, you have to think about it a lot. You have to th really think, okay, I'm going to put my foot down, I'm going to do this, I'm going to put that. You know, you really think about it. But then later, it just becomes like riding a bike. So later, I anticipate that this will be true because um, when we built the program where we hook the synthesizers up to our brains, um, at the beginning, it doesn't feel very natural. But then, after a while, it becomes like moving on the new muscle. And you can modify the sounds with your mind. Well, programming will become very much the same way. And I want to make, make interesting experiments where I do lots of drugs and try and program. But that's in the future. Can I show some images? Um, what, what? I could be, I want to really, really show okay, some so, images. You can keep talking. Um, yeah, so. Let me just finish real quick and then you can do it. Cool. So, um, in the ecosystem, I'm going to need a repository. And I'm going to need to have each sequence or, you know, potential part of a program. Think of it like an IC or a resistor, or like okay. a capacitor, or any, any we'll you know, small section. <laughs> so, they have, to be, they have to be accessible and they have to be able to be, um, I don't know how to call that. Uh, called for. So that's why every sequence has to go, sorry, that's why every sequence has to go forwards and backwards. So when you're writing, so there should be an ecosystem of sequences as well. So when you're writing, you know, what you would be to you, the typical way of writing, and somebody has improved that syntax with a bigger thing. So that would potentially show up. And then a way to combine these parts with a recognized system of inputs and outputs, those sorts of things. But then, I don't really have all this very much yet. I want to really show you guys tomorrow, and I really want to encourage you guys to stop by the table, because um, I will likely have, well, I will likely have a working system. However, there is one catch. The driver for the headset box works on my Linux, but not on my Mac. And the okay. driver for the program works on my Mac, but not my Linux. So well, let me show anyway, um, come by tomorrow. Uh, we need more energy. Peace, guys. So the ones that waited oh, yeah. will be rewarded by some small videos, and you can think of some questions, you know. And but I will uh, wanted to show you at least the video how this stuff can look like, and think of some Q and A questions. Let's see if it's a full HD beamer. Yes! Wow, that's cool. So you can actually really see that video. So this is the old sapphire. That's kind of, you know, I referred to it earlier, but that's you kind of see it in motion. You will see the, that there are uh, indeed certain, certain changes in your brain waves. Like that's an alpha wave right here. You basically have the theta waves here, dreaming waves, alpha waves. So I might have closed my eyes here or relaxed. Sometimes you can even see uh, activity in my right hemisphere. That's kind of how it looks like, just to give you a quick impression. You can make sounds, but Obviously not after rebooting your system, you never reboot. <laughs> um, let's make some images. Um, just quickly go through them. Let's kind of give you an impression about it. Think of some questions. 
What is the brain interface? Yeah, that's the sound SDK. So you can definitely make sound with it. Look, look on the web page. Just to give you, you have seen it. You can build this stuff relatively easily. People use it. It actually works. Just to give you an impression, it can look differently. Like you really see your, your, your mind in that stuff. You know, if you, after 10 or 20 minutes, you see certain patterns. You never get the same patterns. And I could tell you it's friend A or friend B of me as a human. But data mining, of course, also can show you you have certain. And that's what you said. The programming symbolic language basically works like this. You have unique, unique brain waves, wavelets transformation. The system finds, aha, uh -huh, there we have a certain, certain pattern and assigns a symbol to it, assigns symbols to it. And whenever it finds a new pattern that's, that's relatively far away from another pattern, it assigns a new symbol. And that's a universal projection network for, for, uh, system for anything, for sounds, for programming. Usually people sit like this, meditate, look at this. That's, you, can, you, can use, you can use a tunnel thing, that's kind of cool, speed up. So I will uh, yeah, stop talking, you can do Q&A, anybody else can say something, who has something cool to say about brain interfaces, and go through images. Q&A, anyone? Cool. Some heralds will come I to you. I was looking at, at your website while you were speaking, and cool. I, it seems like there aren't a lot of instructions on how you can go about you know, making these headsets or getting these headsets. There's is the there? page, make a headset, and it's kind yeah. of visual. And, yeah, it just um, has, has pictures. <laughs> it gives an inspiration, you know, I kind of want to make you your own headsets. I think mine are very basic. I don't show you my advanced transhumanist handsets, but I show you the basic ones and kind of think you are smart enough to, to invent another way. If you see kind of a visually glimpse at how this guy, what he takes, what he does, I'm sure you can come up. Basically, you just find a system that holds electrodes. You can, you know, lose a welding helmet, like in this uh, example, put some silver on it. You can tighten it. You can basically say, hey, try this headset on a party. You, I'm sure you can do better, you know. But if you want to know, uh, there's a workshop tomorrow, starting at 18 or 20 hours in the hard working area. There are workshops in every major European Californian hackerspace. Uh, that's what I'm basically doing in 2012. And you can always approach me, show me your headset. It's really cool. And uh, I can explain more, you know. I basically found out I'm giving this talk like two or three days ago. So I, I made this wiki in a few days. You can look at the history. Of course, it's not perfect. But if you have questions, you know, but that's kind of a meta question. Um, some real, real question about this? Put your hand up if you have questions. Okay, there's a question here. Uh, Great. I'm interested in the more sort of uh, general uh, view you were like presenting for the future because um, what you're saying is very sort of grassroots, make your own uh, devices and so on, so it's sort of easy, easy access or easy-ish or in principle available for all, but I think uh, the discussion we've had so far, I mean, like uh, neuro enhancement, um, courtesy of medication, say, there's been like a debate in the scientific community about uh, the sort of accessibility of that, and is this, I mean, do you see the danger at all, or do you have any thoughts on the danger at all of this turning to be sort of two-class medicine, uh, that sort of aspect? Well, so because it's about common commercialization and accessibility exactly. of gadgets exactly. also. I, I think I get, I get, I get right where, you, where you're going with this. I think I get where you're going with this. So, for example, one, one program that you could... E yes. So, for example, one program that you could easily do is... Um, You'll have a, it'll, this runs in Node, so you'll be able to get the JavaScript analog outputs really easily. So let's say your friend comes up to you and tells you some really big lie, and you're like, yeah, that's cool, bro. Why don't you put this headset on? That's it. You can make that in five minutes. Yeah, and, and, and the scientific community, they're doing really serious, large double-blind studies, but then we as hobbyists, as hackers, we can give inspiration. And basically, the devices will come anywhere. A anyway, you have uh, devices in commercial, uh, in the iPhone, they will have these devices, that's not the problem. Commercial devices, you will have them every everywhere. But at the beginning of such a movement, if there is a certain collective that reflects this, that works on this in an open environment, not looking necessarily for money, you can have significant uh, influence of how this goes, exactly. So uh, if someone's scanning, you, you can go to a prison, and if you want to get out, they will check your brain waves, and if something is abnormal, you will stay in the prison. What? You know, uh, it's, someone is robbing you of your holiest thing. In quantified self, they will rob you of your body, basically. Or, you know, you, in, in, the, in your living room, in your, in your bathroom, they will scan if you have smoked, you, you get less bonuses. And this will happen anyway, they will check at your brain waves, but if it's an open community, be creative about it, how else we could use this, and then basically shape the, the perception in society to make it not only like, oh, brainwaves, they're controlling my brainwaves, but I am creating my brainwaves. So we still have time for two important questions. 
Ah, okay. Okay. So I have uh, actually two questions, one for each. So in your talk, you said that you could cure a chronic pain in the Do four some sessions. visual indication where you are, please. Ah. <laughs> you said that you could cure a chronic pain in four sessions of 15 minutes each. Did you actually uh, do an experiment? Can you somehow elaborate, substantiate your claim? Uh, please repeat the last part. If you could elaborate on your, your claim that you could cure a chronic pain in four sessions of 15 minutes each. Yeah, that's from the University of Tübingen. But they were using an FMI, FMI machine. So uh, it's, uh, you know, but the basic concept of neurofeedback. I didn't have any chronic pains, but I, I, I made other ex changes to my brain waves. But I mean, it's just, you can look it up. University of Tübingen, they, if you have chronic pain, like a limb, a limb has been separated and you feel pain in a limb that's not there, what are you going to do? You're going to do neurofeedback, uh, lie in, a, in an FMI machine, look at the fire, and try to make the fire less burning, less burning, or more burning. And this is this intuitive visualization thing, like similar to this, or like a fractal multiverse thing, twisting. And people just say, oh, less burning, or maybe more fireworks, more intense, colorful fireworks. And your brain will do whatever it does to have this more intense fireworks, which happens to be the negative of your brain, uh, pain center in your brain. We basically do shut down your, your pain perceptions and turn. Also, if you correlate two hemispheres, two parts of your brain, there will be more connections. So it's really, I think you can reprogram your neural circuits with this technology. <coughs> if you repeatedly do this, there will be more growth, change your mental patterns, basically free yourself. It's mind hacking, self hacking, personal development, you might refer to it, NLP, magic, chaos magic. Okay. Just uh, be whoever you, you want have, to be. Do you and have the authors of the paper? What? Do you have the authors of the paper you're referring to, of University of Tübingen? Who authored the paper? In, I don't, University of Tübingen, you can look it up in Google, uh, all these things, you know, I'm an inventor, I don't, I don't care about blah, blah, double blind studies, because I've seen that myself, I'm just telling you, if you don't believe me, look at no, medical no, just people. just make it easy to find. Look so on the wiki tomorrow, or, or <laughs> Google, you know. Okay, another question for your colleague. Um, you said in the beginning you did an experiment on lung function. Why? Do you remember in the very beginning you did an experiment on lung function yes. where you gave uh, asthma medication to a study group? Could you elaborate a bit on who you did the experiment with? Um, so, what um, what experiment medication did you use and did you uh, have supervision by a physician? So, um, there's on the one hand my own data about how I proved my lung function and there's a different study done by other people that I'm not related with. So, um, I'm not really... Um, that much in detail in this um, study with the placebo. So the basic story is that there are people with asthma um, and they got uh, asthma medication or placebo, which compares to the medication. So they don't know what they got. So um, do you want to know about the thing I did for my own lung function or the study? So um, what I did myself, so it's more or less complicated. It's about um, being relaxed and doing something to relax different parts of my body in hypnosis. So it's um, a longer story for the details, but it worked. Okay, and we have one last question from the internet. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's light. Okay, um, so, sorry. The internet demands to know, um, Meta, what um, brand and model are your sunglasses? And could you please show us um, some um, live demo and please source code of the uh, cool programs you wrote? Yeah, you can go to the wiki. There's a link to the GitHub. And I've been using certain internal things which I will be releasing softly. You know, it's brainwave hacking. If, if, the first time I connected it wrong, trying to make harmony, actually made chaos, you get intense headaches. So this is like um, fusion energy. You can really hurt yourself, you can hurt other people. I'm slowly releasing the things, but you can use BrainBay, that's an open source software, and you have my presets, for example, for this. You go to GitHub, I've linked in the wiki, you go to a brainwave filter chain, and then you get the things you can use open in a program called Brain Bay, and you can really do this. All I, I was showing, I already did. You can do this if you go to the wiki and research a little bit or ask me personally. And the first part of the question was about what again? <laughs> yes, about the sunglasses. Ah, yeah, it's uh, uh, freak out. You know, freak out. 
um, basically coming out. It's like a queer coming out, and they have sunglasses with peace, hippie symbols, and uh, I like them to be uh, conscious of who I'm making eye contact with, who is making eye contact with me, because I'm kind of sensitive and know about brainwaves and probably would like to communicate with you, <laughs> but sometimes choose otherwise. And it's called Freak Out, you can get them on the internet, or actually I got this one from a flea market, from the Mauer Park, or you go to Freak Out in Friedrichshain. They have lots of cool, freaky, out thing stuff, Freak Out. The internet, thank you very much.